Hey, Andrew, welcome to The Market is Open. Hey, Josh, how's it going? Uh, not bad. We've talked about airlines, cruise ship, cruise ships. Let's talk about another sector affected by the coronavirus, and that is the auto sector. Is uh, most, yep. of the, most of them are completely shut down, and you did a video on Tesla actually mm-hmm. talking about could they be could they have their demise yeah so the, yeah there was an article by the motley fool that they covered uh five steps to bankruptcy for tesla so uh yeah so i talked about that on the tmio tesla channel and i guess in this video we're going to talk about general motors and and how they're going to be able to survive this uh recession or whatever's coming uh yeah sure so the first thing is let's look at the news and we did see that gm is making ventilators so f- from my research i saw that gm is saying they could make up to I believe it's a 200,000 ventilators and those could be the cost or to sell is about 20,000 to 50,000 dollars so that could actually be about 7 billion in revenue from them so that's interesting to see that as a company it's more that uh I don't know it seems like GM this could be some source of revenue for them which is big in the sense that you know they had 120 billion of revenue last year to go down to zero for a few months would obviously hurt them yeah, that's a huge uh, loss of revenue. But I guess at the same time, all their costs are going down to effectively zero. Yeah. So one thing I liked you did in your Tesla video, you sort of showed what would Tesla earn in a zero dollar scenario. So I kind of did that with GM too. But it seems that a lot of their employees are hourly. Hourly. Yeah. So according. Yeah. I don't know how many employees they have. I, I was reading one hundred and sixty thousand. Um, I saw here on a document that you sent me, it said ninety eight thousand. So I would say somewhere between 98 and 160,000. Yeah. And then GM 98 to 160 probably. And then some of those employees are hourly. So I was thinking that sort of hourly employees could be, those are easier not to pay sort of thing. So if they said they have, we employ approximately 95,000 hourly employees and approximately 69,000 salary employees. Approximately 48,000 of U.S. employees are in unions. So unions are probably the hardest to sort of not pay, though I feel like anything can, is possible in terms of not paying your workers in such a weird time. But oh, it's a 50%. It says 48,000 is U.S. employees. Yes. So I guess they probably do have 160,000 total, maybe? Yeah, I think at the bottom it says worldwide 164. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, cool. Yeah, and then they say U.S. salaried 48, U.S. hourly uh, 48. So the, I feel like they have some leeway in, you know, if you have an hourly, it sucks being an hourly employee, employee, but I guess you wouldn't be as surprised if you weren't being paid. So I kind of figured that let's just say the median pay, which according to GM's proxy report, so each company, I believe now in the last couple of years, they now list their median pay. It was sort of a movement a couple of years ago where to show how much more the CEO gets than them. So so GM shows its median pay is about 69,000. And I guess I estimated there were 78,000 employees, but let's just say there were 100,000. So that would mean GM's cost would be about $6.9 million, uh, $6.9 billion for the year if they had um, no revenue. So let's just say their cost for all their employees would be $6.9 billion. Yeah, for a full year too. For a full year, which doesn't seem like that much. I think you were doing Tesla, and it's like they're only going to lose like $1.2 billion even with no uh, employees working. Yeah. So then, I mean, if we look at the other costs, like administrative, so obviously there's going to be some costs with idling plants and stuff like that. I don't know, maybe a billion dollars on top of that. Interest expense, another billion. So maybe we get to $9 billion. We were talking earlier. We saw that they have financial loans. So I think the bank is... A decent business for a company to get in especially in auto uh, but obviously uh, GM has about 52 billion of auto loans so if you were to take like a conservative estimate and say they lost 20 percent of the loans which is kind of ridiculously high considering their loans are losing about 1.6 percent right now but if you took you know a 20 percent number then and if they're going to lose 20 percent we're sort of entering a depression type scenario so 20 percent of 52 billion sure that would be uh you're correct, 10 billion of uh, losses on their car loans. But 20% is a gigantic number. It's a pretty gigantic number. But even if they were to lose, let's say, 20% on their auto loans, we they see- They can still afford that, yeah. They can still afford that based on what we were saying. And then the fact is the company had a depreciation um, last year of 7.3 billion and CapEx of 7.6 billion. So mm-hmm. I'm sure not all that CapEx has been spent already, so they can possibly defer that 
and save. And also, they would still have the cars too, right? When they get the cars back. Yeah, exactly. So usually loans aren't written off 100%, but it definitely can cause a cash crunch in the short run. Yeah, in the short run. Okay. And then mm-hmm. so GM on March 24th had a press release saying it had $16 billion of cash, which confirms to what it basically is on the balance sheet at December 31st. It's about $19 billion. It seems overall they have about $32 billion of cash. And given our like potential loss estimate for a year, it seems you know they would pretty comfortably survive uh, in a crash along with Tesla. Um, so... GM could survive, you know, for quite some time in a crash scenario. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's good. That's for GM. That's in GM's favor, I think. So I wanted to look at just Ford very quickly. I think we all know that Ford has been undergoing a bit more difficult times than GM or Tesla, I guess. So- yeah. Like Ford, well, during the financial recession, it was the only one that didn't go bankrupt. Mm-hmm. But I'm assuming they stretched their balance sheet a little bit, perhaps back then. I don't know. Uh, yeah. And now GM is, you know, recovered from bankruptcy and it's a little bit more, uh, it's a leaner company than, than it used to be. So it's, it's funny how Ford, I guess you're saying, is in a worse position now than General Motors. And it was the opposite 10 years ago. Ford seems to be a bit more bloated. I think we were showing that GM had 160,000 employees around and Ford has 194,000. So that is, uh, you know, as a Ford uh, shareholder, it's a bit more concerning when you have you know, an extra 30,000 employees over GM, which adds to the costs in what we're talking about. So we're looking at it 2018, they had 199,000 employees, 2018, 190, but it says substantially all our employees are part of unions. So to me, that is a little scarier as well. Uh, GM, I guess, doesn't disclose that. So technically GM's hourly employees may all also be part of unions, but Ford is telling us straight up there. So that mm-hmm. could be that could mean that it's harder to fire the unions, something like that. So 190,000 employees adds a little bit more to Ford's cost. So that could potentially be, you know, like if we said GM was about seven billion loss, this could be maybe an eight, nine billion dollar loss. I think, yeah, Ford was a bit more concerning just because last year they really didn't earn like their projection for this year for 2020 was we're going to earn about like 120 a share. But if you look, their finance income was pro- is probably about half to 75 percent of that. So it's like their auto business was barely profitable, even without um even before this coronavirus came up, came up. Yeah. And yeah. So what were you, what were the numbers for the, uh, how much their, um, their loan, the loans are, or the financing, I think it was like 80 billion or something. Oh, how much, uh, yeah. How many, uh, sort of loans that Ford has. So yeah, Ford definitely has a lot yeah, more. Yeah. We, yeah. We said GM had about 50, uh, billion dollars worth 52 billion. And mm-hmm. I think Ford has a little bit more, I think it was closer to 80. Yeah, so Ford was basically saying in their last annual report that Ford Credit had the best year on record for them. So they have about $110 billion. So obviously Ford wouldn't be able to survive in a weird scenario where 20% of the loans go bad. But I think it's definitely a bit of a weird scenario. But there is investors do not like banks that focus solely on auto loans like Ally Bank, which used to be part of GM. Their stock is down like 70% as a bank. And the pure credit card uh, issuers like Discover are also down a lot. So People definitely do not want to own, you know, a monoline bank and especially, um, especially like Ford's other businesses auto. So they're not really protected. So they have a bank that may go bad and then their auto business may go bad. So it's, it's not a great situation to be in when you have $110 billion in loans, like GM's loan risk and considering their car profitability, like they're in a bit better of a situation than Ford, but you would think Ford could survive definitely at least like four or five months like this. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, Ford also has, I think, a ton of cash on their on their just the, on their balance sheet. They have like what thirty two billion dollars or something. Mm-hmm. And their whole value of the company is only twenty billion. Yeah. So Ford. And they pulled an additional fifteen billion. They cut the dividend, which was a couple billion, and then they like they they really brought up their cash in a very short period of time because they're expecting the worst, I guess, just in case. So, well, they're trading at four dollars a share, and that was before you're saying that. Yeah, so they're trading at four or five dollars, but that was before any adjustments. It's definitely cheap, but the automakers actually have been trading at like five, six, seven times for a while. Mm-hmm. A while now, there's like some things that are kind of unattractive in it, just because they're so cyclical that they carry so much cash around, and I guess they always seem to have very, very high capex as well, where they're constantly 
you know, spending more money. So I feel like shareholders have valued them at low multiples. And then obviously the risk of uh, what's going to happen in the future with automatic, perhaps automatic cars and, you know, electric companies like Tesla. Well, it's kind of like not a fair situation where, you know, you, you have to shut down your business. So, um, like how long, I don't know, how long could the government keep that going for? But, uh, but like, I guess the, like, like if the, if we solve that problem and, and the economy sort of, uh, or everybody's allowed to go back to work, do you think Ford and GM and all these companies can easily come back? And I think like, it shouldn't be a big problem for them to go back to the, the way they were. They seem to be pretty good at, at ramping back up, uh, in short periods of time. Yeah. And just because GM was much more profitable for before and Ford was sort of saying that their, their auto business wouldn't be that profitable, that I'd be much more comfortable owning GM in a slower environment. Um, Tesla, I guess is also interesting, uh, just because their rapid growth of their, of their company. And I mean, their valuation is definitely high, but when you compare it to, I guess, other tech companies, it's not so high, like, you know, Zoom, or I was looking at a bunch of tech names today, like Citrix or something like that, who have, who hasn't really grown revenue in a while. And they're trading at, you know, 50 times earnings. There's a lot of these tech companies that don't grow revenue that get, you know, hundreds of multiples. Um, so Tesla's like multiple, perhaps, you know, is not as absurd. Yeah. We, yeah, we've been, yeah, we talked a lot about Tesla on the channel. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think, uh, GM, uh, promised to invest like $20 billion into electric cars. So you, you I'm assuming they canceled that program temporarily, <laughs> uh, in order to pay, you know, for things that are going to generate cash right now, right? Because now it's like a crisis. So they're, they're probably going to hold back. Whereas Tesla's main business is, you know, to keep pushing the electric vehicle side of things. So I think that makes like if you want to look at a positive thing for Tesla is that they're going to keep being further ahead in electric vehicles and GM can't catch up if they're not working on it at all. Sure. Um, and then, but the, they do have the advantage of the price of, of oil uh, is down. And so you would be more incentivized to buy just a regular gas car when the price of oil is cheap. Uh, yeah. And especially these big cars where Ford, for example, and GM make a ton of money, like the pickup truck division is super profitable for them. So I guess uh, if you expect the price of oil to stay down for a long time, then those are the types of cars people will gravitate to. The only issue maybe with that argument is the argument would only be true if Tesla is sort of working and getting further ahead right now. So if Tesla is, then the argument would be true. But if Tesla's also idled right now, then it would. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't I, mean, be true. I guess it's, it's true in both cases. No one's buying cars either. So no one's going to take advantage of these lower gas prices. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, but Tesla, at least the software division is going to be working. And yeah. because all, a lot of the hardware is also in software, then they can technically work on the new fa you know, new factory components and things like that all from home. Like the employees can work from home. It's mm -hmm. not a big deal. But the factory itself can't can't open. Sure. So I guess Tesla could definitely get a little further ahead and they're already quite far ahead in electric. So that should help them out. I guess lastly, we sort of wanted to talk about that. I don't think really anything changed since the beginning of the year. I mean, for where you'd want to put your money in auto. So I kind of have an interesting idea for auto of where to play it. So I was looking at Cooper tire rubber and their revenue has been quite stable over time. And what I noticed is like 70% of tires are made out of petroleum and with the oil price dropping, um, that's pretty good for tire companies. So that was one stock I sort of saw to play from the fallout. Uh, Cooper Tires, most of its facilities are idled right now, though they say that their Chinese factory is working. And there are a few other things that I liked about Cooper Tire, like their interest expense has been about $30 million for the last three years, but this year should only be $15 million as they refinance the debt, a legacy debt that seemed to have been issued during the last financial crisis. And then... There's sort of like a made up expense that people might not be familiar with, but it's like an amortization of actuarial loss, which is a, it's, it's a weird account, but basically it's sort of similar to this. Let's say you have an investment in GM stock and it was at $30, it went down to 20. So you lost $10, but for whatever reason, when that happens in your pension account, they amortize that loss over say like 10 years. So you would report a $1 loss every year rather than 
showing that you lost ten dollars in the current year. I don't know why the pension accounting does that, but there's sort of some specific rules on when they amortize the loss versus when they put it into the earnings. And because Cooper had an, a pension loss like five or six years ago, they're going to amortize that into the earnings for like the next like ten years or something. So their so their net income is actually thirty five million on top of what it is before, and. Obviously, they're going to go to zero right now. But when you look at all the things together, it's like, well, this company is earning about three, four dollars a share. Their main input cost is about to drop like 80 um, percent. That seems pretty attractive. And when oil was lower, they were making three, four dollars a share. So it looks like they could make six, seven a share if oil stays low after this. And I, I'm actually a, a bet. I'm a, I want to bet big. Like if I had to bet big, if I had to guess, I would say oil remains around 20, 30 dollars for a lot longer than I think the economy turns around. And the price of oil stays, you know, in the thirty dollars range for a long time. We were talking about the pension stuff. Like, do other companies have do it the same way, like GM and Ford? If uh, and like, what would qualify as a pension loss? Like, yeah. the stock market falling means they need to add more money into the pensions, and that that means that that difference is a loss. Yeah, I think that would be a loss. The pension, like, I'd have to restudy my pension accounting notes, yeah. but let's just say for all intents and purposes. Uh, that that would be the loss that we're talking about. Another could be sort of the actuary of the pension plan says the discount rate for the future liabilities is 1% instead of 3%. So that could raise it. That could raise, you know, what the future liability, it could bring up the value. So that could be another reason the liability grows. But I think it's fine to just say like, for whatever reason, the asset shrinks and the liability grows, um, whether due to reevaluation and that causes a loss that isn't recognized right away. Mm. And okay, so then everything is spread out over time for pensions, and they'll recognize it over time. Yeah, and I like Warren Buffaroo. Um, so if we just pull up this quickly before we end it, so Berkshire Hathaway, if you were to look at their annual report this year, they actually earned like seventy-seven billion dollars. This year, Berkshire earned eighty-one billion dollars, um, and that's because their Apple investment went up by like fifty billion dollars. But the thing is. Uncle Buffer wasn't very happy that he, instead of holding, you used to be able to hold that gain and then recognize it whenever you want, but now you just recognize it right away. So for, for investments, the accounting says you have to recognize it right away, but for pensions, they say you can recognize it over time. So it's an, a bit of an inconsistency in the accounting rules. Okay, pretty cool. Yeah, so that's it. Okay, all right. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed our update on car companies and which part of it to play.